Hello everyone and welcome to video number six of paleoecology in which we're going to be looking at large scale trends. So we're going to be looking at some of the latest research that uses kind of big data tools to look at the distribution of fossils in space and time. I think it's a really exciting research field right now so I'm, I'm really keen to introduce you to it. So as I've mentioned, today uh, we can use not only the fossil record, but digital tools to assess long-term patterns uh, in the fossil record. And we can study things that really matter to us in this way, like biodiversity in deep time and how it responds to changes in climate. So we started thinking about this to an extent in our extinctions lecture. And this kind of um, this video builds on that a little bit, providing a brief insight into the latest research looking at diversity in deep time and how that responds to past climates and so how these two things interact. I wanted to start by highlighting that everything is connected. So there seem to be links, as shown on this slide, between sea level, the amount of continental shelf and the diversity of life. Here you can see the continental configuration for a series of periods from just over 500 million years ago through to today. Um, and you can see that at time periods, we've had single supercontinents and at other periods, there's been quite a lot of continental fragmentation, which dictates the amount of continental shelf, these um, uh, eco kind of um, these relatively shallow um, ecosystems, which we have through every given time period. You can see how that's related here to a uh, sea level. Um, and if we look on the right hand side here, you can see the Sepkoski curve that we first met as part of the extinction lecture. And you can see that there are periods where we get increases in diversity that are associated with uh, continental configurations with a high degree of fragmentation. So just to quickly recap what we talked about in terms of these um, diversity curves, uh, Sepkoski collated information from a wide range of sources um, on a range of marine animal families in genera. He then graphed the diversity of these, and he showed a series of patterns. So our dips here, marked with red lines, mark our major extinctions. And Sepkoski, on the basis of these curves, suggested that there were three great evolutionary faunas in the marine animal fossil record. We have the Cambrian fauna, these, uh, the, this fauna that we associate with these weird wonders that were around in the Cambrian period. That then reduces in diversity and it appears to be replaced by the Paleozoic fauna. And then after the PT extinction, the Paleozoic fauna takes a hit. And in terms of the, the diversity we see today, there's a whole different fauna, the modern fauna, which kind of replaces that. So I'm just moving my microphone slightly. Uh, so these are groups that Sepkoski identified um, by looking at diversity patterns and turnover rates and similar ecologies, and all of those vary with each other. And it appears that you've got this replacement of one um, by the next as, as the dominant groups change during the Phanerozoic. So in its basic form, that was the start of this big data approach. Obviously, it wasn't done entirely digitally as it is done now today, um, but this was the, the start of that form of thinking. You can also see on this graph that we appear to have an increase in diversity to the present. So the diversity today is higher than at any point during the geological record. That's a really interesting observation. So let's think a tiny bit more about that. Do you think that could be because the amount of diversity is genuinely increasing through time? That would be a, um, a, a kind of a direct reading of that graph. Or could this be an artifact? So if we think about this a bit more, we would identify that we have more recent rocks. The, the, the further we go back in the fossil record, the fewer rocks we have. So does this mean that we're just better able to sample diversity as we get towards more recent time periods? Another way of thinking about this that's complementary is that the living fauna is the best sampled fauna that we have. So when it comes to looking at ranges, so saying drawing lines between the first occurrence and the last occurrence of any given taxon, be that a family or a genus, we have the best sampling today. And that means that we'll see a larger number of ranges being pulled through today, and that will be artifactually 
increasing the diversity that we associate with now and we see increasing diversity towards this point. And this is an idea called the pull of the recent. How can we overcome this? Or how can we work out if this is indeed an issue? Well, we can do so by using modern technology. A really fantastic example of this is the paleobiology, <laughs> that's not a word, paleobiology database. So you can see the web portal for this on this slide here. You can find uh, this database at either of these two URLs. There was a schism in the community and there were two versions sampling the same database. But this is a really good example of how digital tools can help us because this is a curated list of more than 420,000 fossil species. It records, for example, for example, where the fossils were found and when the species that are being sampled were alive and a whole load of other kind of metadata associated with any given species. And using resources like this, coupled with statistical techniques, often in the programming language R, we can try to start and correct for artifacts like the pull of the recent and really dig down into the patterns that underlie that. So that the genuine patterns that aren't, that are ecological or evolutionary rather than based on sampling. I suppose my choice of words there suggests that that's not a genuine pattern. That is a genuine pattern, but we know what that pattern is. We know that we're sampling more towards the recent. And so if we're interested in these ecological or evolutionary questions, we kind of want to get rid of that. Um, in order to illustrate uh, that, this uh, I've chosen to uh, feature a figure from this fantastic paper um, that was led by my colleague Roger Close and colleagues that was has just come out, in fact. And it's a really nice example of how we can use these new techniques to dig deeper down into these questions. So this paper uses 396,000 occurrences of 2000, sorry, 22,800 marine animal genera. So for each genus, we have multiple occurrences. These, an occurrence is just the discovery of a member of that genus in the fossil record. And so we're looking at marine animals here. And it considers both the sampling of the fossil record, so how well sampled um, we think the uh, fossil record is based on how much um, outcrop area of the rocks there are from this time period, for example, and also its geographical scope. So how much of the paleocontinental configuration our fossils are actually sampling. So this is really nice and nuanced. It's very new, in fact, because it cares about space. It starts thinking about not only how much sampling we have, but how that sampling is distributed over our paleocontinents. And that's really, really important. I say our paleocontinents. I suppose more accurately what I mean is our paleo-oceans. And this figure shows the diversity over the uh, past from the Cambrian through to to today of these marine animal genera when correcting for sp both space um, and for sampling. So these are what we would call spatially standardized diversity patterns. And as you can see on the basis of these graphs here, there is relatively little evidence for sustained long-term increases in diversity when you apply a correction. As opposed to the previous Sepkowski graph that we were looking at, here, we don't see this increase to the present. Rather, what we see is a series of up and down, ups and downs. That's quite interesting. Those are telling us something that's happening about these time periods, but without a general increasing trend. What the, um, this paper actually does is identifies that a major control on diversity seems to be the extent of re re <laughs> reef ecosystems in the, um, in the past. So it seems like our controlling factors may be something um, like reefs rather than uh, any of the other patterns that we may identify within this data set. So that's a really important piece of work that's showing us something about um, the controls on biodiversity in the deep past. Reefs are clearly very, very important. So I hope that's, that's a useful and interesting insight. I certainly really enjoyed reading the paper. So remember, through all of this, that the biosphere, the lithosphere, so that's all of the rocks, and the atmosphere are all connected. Everything is interlinked. So on this diagram here, you can see uh, proxies for climate, 
um, you can see extinctions, you can see volcanism, and you can see sea levels, as well as um, the fact that in the last 600 million years, the Earth has oscillated at least five times between ice house, so cold, and greenhouse, so warm conditions, most often being in a greenhouse climate. And you can see links between many of these different um, events that have been happening. So for example, you can see some links between the amount of volcanism and sea level. You can see that those two seem to be linked in some way to climate. And you can see that extinctions seem to follow some of these shifts between greenhouse and ice house conditions, for example. And we can't really unlink everything. We can say, for example, in terms of broad patterns, that ice houses at ice house periods seem to have lower diversity um, between, uh, sorry, lower diversity than a greenhouse periods do. And we can see that extinctions happen at these transitions. But also we can see extinctions that happen between them. So there's this really complex nuanced picture of these big scale patterns that occur over the history of the Earth system. So with that said, uh, we should then think about, okay, we've got this complex system. How can we unpick it? What can we do to try and understand what has happened in the uh, geological past? Well, periods of climate change in the past can help us to try and understand the impact that we have on the Earth today using these digital um, tools. So it's a really active and broad area of research, and I'm going to be touching on it largely so you know it is, exists. Um, if you want to learn more about it, which I, I think is really interesting, you may want to do some reading around it. And so I've chosen a paleoecology um, based example to demonstrate this. And this is based on the Carboniferous period. So this is one example of how we can try and untangle this complex situation and understand that the, the impact that climatic changes have had on the biosphere. So during the Carboniferous, uh, at around 315 million years ago, we have a rich belt of forest that spans essentially the equator of the Earth. So we've got this time period um, where we've had a southern continent called Gondwana that's moved north and collided with the northern continent, a thing called La Russia, um, to create this supercontinent Pangaea. And around this equatorial band, we have rich um, rainforests that are associated um, with where we find coal deposits today. So there's a whole series of reasons that if, if you would like to ask about them, please do ask in the um, Zoom session, where uh, for a whole variety of reasons, we've got um, coal forming around this equatorial band. These are what are known as the Carboniferous Coal Forests. So these are, we're talking kind of like really rich, wet um, ecosystems that are associated with swamps, so kind of very, very um, rainforesty, very, very good, we imagine, for um, terrestrial life. But towards the end of this period, um, so around 307 to 303 million years ago, those rainforests start to disappear from large parts of the globe. This is a thing called the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse. And these ecosystems are replaced in the early, early Permian period, um, and you can see a Permian um, paleo map here, um, by dry land vegetation as a more arid climate develops. We see, for example, the um, appearance of evaporites. These are marked by uh, the pink spots on this map, replacing our coal um, deposits that are marked by black spots on this map. Map. And all of that represents this change, this aridization of the Earth. So this is a major shift in climate that happened at around 305 million years ago. So a really cool question we may want to ask is how did life respond to this? Uh, my colleague Emma Dunn and a series of uh, her colleagues uh, have published a paper in 2018 actually looking at this using a similar approach to the uh, the one that Roger Close used in my last example for you. Um, so this uses the paleobiology database um, to try and study diversity across this time period. It corrects for sampling issues uh, as we saw with Roger Close's example um, and uses a thing called a network biogeography methods to try and understand what's going on over this transition period. This study showed that di diversity did very closely follow sampling. 
So that's the first important thing. The more we sample these ecosystems, the higher the diversity appears. When we correct for this, as uh, Emma and colleagues have done on the graph in the left here, we see that species richness initially increases into the late Carboniferous period, so that's this point here, but then decreases substantially across the Carboniferous to Permian boundary. Um, and this is the time period at which this fragmentation was happening. So on the basis of this uh, work, it appears like this fragmentation led to a decrease in diversity. That's really interesting. Um, we also then see um, diversity slowly recovers, recovering through into the early Permian period. So as well as that, the um, network biogeography elements of this paper clustered um, faunas into those representing different paleogeographic areas, allowing the distribution of our fossils to be assessed. So this is what's shown on the right. Here you can see our different clusters uh, based on geography in different colors. So in this particular example, there were seven clusters that we used for this analysis. And what this suggests, and this piece of work goes on to conclude, is that rather than species becoming fractured and less widespread as a, resp as a uh, response to this Carboniferous rainforest collapse, they seem to become more widespread. And the authors suggest that this could be because we have fewer barriers um, in this time period. So we start getting more of our species spreading out between our different clusters. Communities appear to become better connected, but that is matched by a lower global diversity. So you've got a decrease in diversity, but an increase in um, the spread of the species that are there. And this is a really nice example, looking not only at the impact that climatic change has on our ecosystems, but then providing a nuanced insight into how those ecosystems changed as this uh, event, the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse, was happening. So I think that's pretty cool, and I wanted to highlight it here. But that was a very, very brief overview of this very active field at the moment. Um, I've put a bunch of reading on the website below this video if you want to learn more about these techniques, and I would encourage you to engage with that if you find this interesting. And if you're interested in kind of in research later in your careers, I think this is a very active and exciting area in which um, which I certainly, uh, if I were to retrain, would like to spend some of my time looking into. So I thought I would highlight that here. But that that's it for me. That that that's it for paleoecology. That's the end of our series of videos on paleoecology. I hope they've proven interesting and I look forward to discussing some of these issues with you further in issues, not issues per se, but further discussing this topic with you in our Zoom session. So I'll see you sometime soon.